Hey everyone, History Mystery Man here coming to you today from the Legacy Autosport Race Shop in Pittsburgh, Indiana. Really excited about this one today. We're going to chat with Louis Meyer III and the fourth, the grandson and great-grandson of Louis Meyer, the first three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500. Yeah, it gets better from here. So excited. Welcome aboard where the History Mystery Man is on duty and always at your service. Let's do it. Legacy Autosport. Let's go see what it's all about. Ooh, you gotta ring the doorbell here. All right. Hey, well, thanks for uh, thanks for getting me in the door. No problem. Come on in. Very cool. I'm a little early, I know. That's fine. I love that car. I know it's in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, is it not? Yeah. I, I took a picture of a gold 14, and I'm sure that's it. Yeah. That's so cool. This picture here is my grandfather in the 14 car. Yep. Then his father, who was a French bicycle racer for Peugeot, Really? And uh, yeah, he was for uh, Peugeot. Yeah, for Peugeot. His Ed, father, yeah. Edward Meyer. Yeah, Edward Meyer. Edward Meyer. And then okay. uh, the last picture is my dad. Uh, he tried driving Sunny. He tried driving midgets and stuff, but he actually liked the boats better. He was three-time APBA A Hydro champion. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah, he, that's uh, news. Wow, that's neat, Peugeot. I mean, uh, Peugeot to me is an engine builder. Yes, well, sir. The back then they made bicycles. I mean, I okay. don't know what was that. What e year do you think 18, that would be? Eighteen something. Eighteen eighty something. Eighteen ninety. Yeah. Cars. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, uh, when he, I guess I don't know if you call it retired from bicycle racing, became a barber. That's what he did. He was a really. Barber. Yeah. Well, that's him behind the fourteen car. Yeah, and that's that's him right there behind the fourteen car, that's... and that's Alden Sampson right there. Who was Alden the Sampson? Alden Sampson was the gentleman that when my grandfather was working, uh, putting the two Duesenberg cars together in 1928, Alden, this is a story my grandfather told me, Alden came by the shop one day and wanted to be a gopher, wanted to help out. My grandpa said, well, we can't pay you, but we can give you food and give you board and stuff, and yeah, you can do that. So Alden hung around and uh, helped my grandpa put those cars together, ran errands and did stuff. Hey, by the way, that's interesting. I've gone on that same plan before. Uh, we can't pay you, but we'll feed you. <laughs> I, I can relate to that one. Yeah. Oh, that that is so interesting. You know, I Peugeot caught my attention because I know your um, grandfather Louis Meyer, the first three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500, his first victory there in 28, 1928. He won in a Miller car. Right. Yeah, Miller car with a Miller engine. Yeah, it was a Miller engine. Yes. In fact, I'll tell you what happened. Um, in 1927, my grandfather relief drove for Wilbur Shaw. And uh, because Wilbur was out running, he got overheated, had to come in. My grandpa had a license. He'd been doing some racing. He started, I think, in 26, 25. And I've uh, been doing some racing. So I threw him in the car to go out and keep the car out. So anyways, he stayed out there, and I think he picked up a couple positions. And the Duesenberg saw it and said, man, this guy's got some talent. So as what their deal was is if he built two Duesenberg cars at the factory, he could drive one, and then they were going to put it like a paid driver in the other. So anyways, um, he built the two cars. They got to the speedway. I guess he did a little bit of testing. He came in one day. The Duesenberg said, hey, we need some money, so we're selling your car. You don't have a ride. <laughs> the story he told me was, he goes, I'm sitting on the wall thinking, man, he goes, I got like 18 cents in my pocket. I don't have any money. He goes, I need to get a job because I got to get back home. And he said, so um, he goes, Alden come up to me and said, hey, Harry Miller has a car for sale. And he goes, let's buy that car and run the Indy 500 with it. My grandpa goes, Alden, I don't have any money. And Alden said, well, my parents have money. I've, I've talked to my father. He's wiring us the money. We're buying the car. And that's the car right there. So they bought the car. And my yep. grandpa said, we had no tools. We had nothing. So him and Harry Miller were good friends. So Harry said, use my tools, use my garage, do whatever you need to do. So they found him a spot to work on the car. They tore the car completely down and went through the entire chassis and everything. Then they went through the motor and uh, got it back together. And he told me that on race morning, he qualified it, I think, 13th. And then they tore the motor down and went through it. And he said, race morning, they were still bolting body panels on the car. And he goes, they put her out on the front stretch, started off, and won the Indy 500. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool story. It's, it's a really uh, cool story. Yeah. I absolutely love it. He not only 
won the Indianapolis 500 for the first time in 1928. He later that year went on to win a 200 miler, I believe on the board track in yep. Altoona, Pennsylvania, yep. which I mean, how cool is that? I, yeah, I, he loved, he told me, he goes, he, he loved the boards. They were a lot of fun, but he goes, they were just very dangerous because not only did you have to worry about, you know, the board track, but those boards would break. There'd be big holes in the, oh my so God. you had to really pay attention not to get a tire hooked in one of those holes and crash. G giant so. splinters and spears, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And a lot of people died at Altoona and on the board tracks, Nutley, New Jersey, and you yeah. can you can pick your board track, but they were they were fatal yes, uh, they were. For, for many. Uh, but what a fascinating era. And I know he went on to win the National AAA Championship that 28 season as well. So, yes, he did. I mean, it's just, just an, that season alone for Louis Meyer was amazing in itself. Um, and, and he did it as a rookie right. in 28. So right. I don't even... Do you even know? Has that ever been done? That a rookie went to the Brickyard and won the Indianapolis 500? Was was Troy Rutman a rookie? Well, Jacques Villeneuve. Okay. Technically, you know, was yeah, it was a year. rookie. Yeah, yeah. One, I think one other driver has done it. I think that rookie for the Speedway. Yeah, for the Speedway. You mentioned your great grandfather, a bike racer for Peugeot. Did yeah. you say? Yeah. Well, I, that caught my attention because Peugeot was the forerunner to the Miller engine that four cylinder, four valves per cylinder, double overhead cam thing, the, really the, what became the modern day race engine was born with the French and the Peugeot. Right. Um, we liked it so much here that uh, Miller tuned in on it and turned it into that technology and made it a Miller. Miller eventually became Offenhauser. And I know you're familiar with the, with the Meyer Drake story as okay. it went from there, but Peugeot was the forerunner to uh, all the modern day race engines. I always thought that was interesting. Oh my God. This is Sonny Meyer here. Yep. This is the Meyer and Drake engine. That's your dad. Yep, and that's the off the engine. That's Sonny Meyer, Louis Meyer, Dale Drake and John Drake, his son. Wow. And that was Meyer and Drake Engineering. That's a cool photo. Yeah. And this photo here is when, in 1965, we moved back to Indianapolis and took over the sole distributorship for the Double Cam Ford. My grandfather sold out to Dale Drake. Drake took it over and turned it into Drake Engineering. We came back and started Lewis Meyer Incorporated, which was the sole distributor for the Double Cam Ford for Ford Motor Company. And that's a picture of my dad with the turbo Ford. And by the way, we should say that you are Louis Meyer the fourth, or Louis Michael Meyer, is it? Technically the fourth. The fourth. Uh, my mom didn't want me to be the fourth son, Louis Michael Meyer. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> understood. <laughs> well, you're gonna be the fourth today, mister. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> what is Legacy Auto Sport? What is it you do? We'll okay. Yeah, we'll take show you the shop, but Legacy Auto Sport is um, basically something I've been dreaming for you know ever since i was a little kid and uh, wanted to continue the family tradition of racing so we've been racing since before there was even cars you know like sure. great great grandfather raced bicycles and you know we just we've been at the speedway if in four more years it'll be a hundred years of the as a family we've been at the indianapolis motor speedway so well that's amazing in itself yeah. is there another family that has a longer tenure at the brickyard no i can't imagine there would be but anyway what legacy auto sport is, is is we participate in the road to andy and we run usf 2000 and pro 2000 cars and um this year simon sykes is in our one of our usf 2000 cars and uh we're uh Trying to go for the championship for that right. deal. Simon wants to move up to pro. He wants to be an IndyCar driver someday. So if we can pull it off and win the championship this year, we'll get the scholarship from USF and that'll move us up to pro and then he can go from there. Yeah. And and by the way, um, and we're gonna get to that. Did you, well, hello, <laughs> Tweety Tat. Did uh, you know your uh, great grandfather? I or, did. or you I did. did? I didn't know if you were too young or no. I no. did. I, I he was. I was 15 when he passed away. Oh, okay. And, uh, so I got to spend a lot of time with him. I would. Uh, my aunt in the summertime. My great aunt, which is uh, uh, Kay Bignati, um, she. Whoa, would... whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. Your <laughs> your great aunt? Did you say? Yes. Yeah. Is my Kay Bignati? Bignati? Would that wife. be George's wife? Yes. Yeah. Is she still alive? Yes, she is. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah, they were married about 20, about 20, 22 years. Because ago. George Bignotti has been gone for a long time. Yeah, he's been gone. Yeah, gone for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But she would come pick me up in the summertime, 
and uh, she lived in Las Vegas. And we'd go hang out in, in Vegas, and then we'd go to Searchlight, Nevada, and I'd spend time with my great grandpa. And and uh, it, when I was really young, I got to visit with my great grandmother as well. Uh, she passed away, and then um, um, you know it was just my great grandpa, and we'd go to the lake, and he'd ride jet skis, and he rode jet skis till he was what ninety. Yeah, yeah, in fact, um, oh, oh, your your grandfather, yeah, yeah, rode story. jet skis till he was yeah, ninety. He, uh, I worked at Granatelli Racing. You should have a Phoenix picture Rose. of that. I worked at Granatelli Racing an engine shop, and when my grandma passed away, my grandpa lived in Searchlight, Nevada, which is kind of out in the middle of the desert. He did that because she got emphysema and it just prolonged her life. So when she did pass away, Mike and I on Friday we jump in the car with our jet skis, take off from no. Phoenix, and drive over to the lake and spend the weekend with him then drive back on Monday morning. But yeah, we uh, we had this sit down jet ski and uh, my grandpa, he was about 90 and he's like, hey, uh, you know, I'd really like to ride the jet ski. So no, like, okay. kidding me. So we take it down to the dock and this is the Colorado River, it's Lake Mojave it's called. Mm -hmm. And we take it down to the dock and we get it fired up and everything, he's fully clothed he gets on the jet ski. The ranger's well, standing down there. you gotta there. remember, he takes his hearing aids out and puts oh, yeah. them in a little Ziploc bag. <laughs> yeah, he took his hearing aids Puts them in his pocket. <laughs> so he gets on the jet ski. The ranger's standing right there. He shoves that thing wide open, and he is running out of the marina. And the ranger's just looking at him, and he goes all the way across. That's about two miles away is this place we used to go to to swim called Black Rock. So he gets to Black Rock, and he just runs her up on the beach. So we're in the boat, we jump in the boat, we take off, we're going after him. We get over there and he's standing there going, where have you guys been? You know, I've been here for what, how long, you know? <laughs> I'm just That's like, so cool. Oh, uh, he is such a character. I mean, we, uh, this is such a treat for me. My, one of my dreams in life is to, would have been to have had the opportunity to sit down with uh, your, your grandfather, your great grandfather, uh, and have a conversation with Louis Meyer, the first three time winner of the Indy 500. Uh, and I could go right, uh, you know, any driver from that era, the 20s, 30s, 40s, and, and 50s, it fascinates me, but I can't because they're gone, but, but you guys did. I mean, were there lessons you took away from Louis Meyer uh, well, that, that stand what, out to you? When I was growing up, I didn't watch TV at night. I would sit there and listen to my grandmother tell me about all their adventures as they traveled across the country how US 40 was just a little two lane road and they'd go from California to Annapolis towing their race car on the back. I mean, it was all the stories that she had and all the things that she told me and everything, even as a, you know, as a, as a young boy, I mean, it, it's so interesting. And, and the history of the racing and all this stuff, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it, it was really special, it was really special. What, what was he to you? Was, was he just grandfather? What, was, he, was he heavy on discipline? Uh, did he teach lessons? You or? know, he was probably one of the most honest men I've ever met in my life. That was one thing I always, I always, you know, felt about him is, is, is you never in all the years, I mean, I was in IndyCar racing for over 40, 45 years. And of all the people that I met over the years, I never had one person say anything like, well, your grandpa, you know, I mean, did me wrong or something like that. You know, they had nothing but praise to talk about him, what a good man he was. And you know what, when you're coming up, you know, in a, in a family deal like this, like my grandpa, my dad, myself, and now Mike, that holds a lot because your reputation is everything. And if, if, if your family's giving you a bad reputation, you come into the sport, it's gonna follow along. People are gonna look at you and wonder if you're any good or not. So, uh, you no, know, what, he, what he gave to us was, was amazing, you know what I mean? And, and, and the things that he did. Was... Um, okay, I don't wanna take away from what, uh, what's going on here in the shop and it looks like there's some things going on but I you know I look at this and it looks like I don't want to call it a miniature Indy car but what what exactly are we looking at here it's, that's pretty much what it is it's um, a USF 2000 car okay um, it's a Tatus chassis they're built over in Italy just like the Dallara cars are today um, you know it's it's basically it's a training ground it's college for Indy car drivers and this is the first step of the road to Indy and you have the USF 2000, and we're actually waiting on our uh, pro car right now, uh, but it's a little more, has more downforce, 100 more horsepower, uh, bigger tires, a more aero, but it's the same chassis as this. So you can update your USF 2000 car to run pro, the next level, and then after that, if you win the pro championship or you, you graduate up, you run Indy Lights. 
and then after Indy Lights, you know, you're uh, you're on to Indy cars. So, uh, in fact, when I uh, worked on Indy Lights cars for a lot of years, uh, I got the chance. I won the Freedom 100. Um, my car won the Freedom 100 four times. So, uh, in fact, the the four wide finish. I remember that. That was my car. That one? Yeah. Wow. Cause we I won do the, that was on the oval though. That yes, was that yeah. was not a road course. Yeah, thing. yeah, no, no. That was the that was the uh, that was the Indy Lights cars on the oval. Uh, we won back to back years. We won the four wide finish, and then we came back with the driver that finished second that year and won the next year. I mean, that had to have been the closest four wide finish in the history of auto racing. Oh, I don't even know if there has ever been a four wide no. finish, and, <laughs> and that thing was inches tight all across oh, the yeah. board yeah. that was that was really amazing i do remember that very well yeah. it's hard to forget that one i do understand that you guys are building obviously you're building a sprint car i can see it uh, but. but this was uh two years ago um kind of as a birthday present for my dad you know 65th birthday um started building uh, a car for him because he wanted to run the uh, it was called the Vintage uh, Sprint Car Association, American Vintage Sprint Car Association at the time. Um, we built, it's kind of a, a Nibel-ish car, you know, kind of a tribute car. It has a little bit of our own stuff on it, but um, built it from the ground up. It's bent the frame up. I, I made the jigs and everything. And um, I raced sprint cars from yeah. 1973 until 1978. And then in 1978, my dad decided that uh, we should go Super V racing or Mini Indy racing. And that was the step from, from uh, Mini Indy cars to Indy car. Well, we bought a Lola and um, went Mini Indy racing and Ralt brought out a new car that had ground effects on it. The Lola did and it was a flat bottom. So that Lola couldn't keep up with, uh, with the Ralt. We didn't have the funding to be able to go out and buy another car and do all that stuff. So at the end of, of uh, 78, um, my dad said, you know, he goes, uh, why don't you come and start building engines? So, cause I'd been doing it on the side, you know, working at the shop and stuff anyways. So, uh, I was married then and, and, uh, had some kids coming along and all that stuff. So, uh, that's why I stopped driving a sprint car. You, you but, decided you needed to make a living. Yeah, I needed to make a living, put some food on the table, but I'll tell you what, I missed it so much over the years and I follow sprint car racing and uh, I told Mike, I said, one day I want to get back in a sprint car. And so he was kind enough to build the car for me. We put it together here and everything. I'll tell you what, it's it's amazing. I love driving a sprint car. It's so much fun. <laughs> I can only imagine. W were you not the, if I read it right, the sole distributor for the double overhead Ford? Yes. In, 19, in, in 1964, uh, Henry Ford approached my grandfather about um, uh, building a Ford engine to come to Indianapolis and, and, uh, and doing those engines in, in competition with the Alfie. And so my grandpa wanted to build both engines in the same plant out in California. Ford wouldn't have anything to do with it. So that's why my grandpa sold out to Dale Drake. In fact, he went to Dale and said, do you want to do the Ford and I do the Alfie? Or you want to do the Alfie and I'll do the Ford. So Dale and him decided Dale would do the Alfie, he'd do the Ford. They stayed the best of friends through the whole deal. I was wondering how they got along, oh, yeah. being no, a partnership no, they, for so they long. They got along great, and, Did they? and, it, and it came full circle because um, we moved from California to Indiana in 65. Uh, my, my dad started and my grandpa started Lewis Meyer Incorporated. Uh, we did the Ford engines, which was the normally aspirated 255 Ford. Well, in the meantime, Dale was turbocharging the Offy. So the Offy beat the Ford. So my grandpa and, and uh, my dad turbocharged the Ford. Well, then we beat the Offie. So anyways, the turbocharged Ford was kind of the engine of choice. Well, in 1970, Ford wanted to get out of IndyCar racing. So they came to my grandpa and said, do you want to buy all the stuff, you know, and continue on? Well, he knew there was an engine coming from Europe, from Formula One, the Cosworth DFX. He knew that engine was coming. That engine, even though it was a V8, it was smaller, it was lighter, it made more power. I mean, it was, it was, going to be an engine that would beat the Ford. So he said, no, I don't want to do it. So Foyt, AJ Foyt came in, bought everything from Ford and renamed the engine the Foyt Ford. And so you'll see the door cam Ford with the Foyt cam covers on it. And that's how AJ got that engine. And then he developed it from there. So.